Nie, nie, nie. Głośniki idą tam. Ale jest to tutaj jeden nie, jest Gdzie jest, jest głośnik do nas skierowany? Do nas, do nas, do nas, to może, może będę zbawił. W razie czego powtórzę, jeżeli pan czegoś nie dostał. Dzień dobry, good morning. Part of this conversation will be conducted in English because of our guest from United Kingdom. And part of it will be conducted in Polish. You have all the translated, uh, translation equipment, so please use it if you need so. And without further ado, let me start the panel about culture and new technologies. Uh, and I would like to welcome our speakers. Uh, the first uh, is uh, Mr. Douglas Murray. Uh, good morning. Uh, a British writer and a journalist, uh, one of the most important conservative commentators and columnists in United Kingdom, author of best-selling book, you may, you may know it, uh, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race and Identity, founder of the Center for Social Cohesion. Good morning, Mr. Murray. Good morning. Uh, and our guests from Poland, uh, first Professor Andrzej Zybertowicz, sociologist, uh, writer, advisor to the President of Poland and to the Chief of National Security Bureau and also a political commentator, very active in media. Good morning, Mr. Professor. And Professor Andrzej Nalaskowski. Uh, Aleksander Laskowski, I'm sorry, uh, pedagogue, University of Mikołaj Kopernik in Toruń, author of more than 20 books, member of National Development Council of President of Poland, Andrzej Duda. Good morning, Mr. Professor. And my name is Marcin Makowski, I'm a journalist uh, in Virtualna Polska web portal, and I will be having a pleasure to have this conversation and ask a questions. Let me start from a general uh, question to all of the speakers, and uh, Professor Nalaskowski would be answering in Polish. It would be better uh, for him, and, but question will be in English. And we are all seeing and living in the world when culture collides with new technologies. The new technologies change and the shape of the world that we live in, but the general question is, does this change lead us to something good? Facebook ad system is designed to polarize, and the company proposedly fueled the system uh, of uh, polarization, Washington Post recently claimed. We all know how much input uh, social media had over the US election, according to Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, and tech companies that are supposed to unite the world and bring the fair communication tools to the less developed society now acts like the above the state business corporation that are creating more problems that they solved. Do we, as a society and internet users, still have control over the cultural and social discourse in the internet and the new technology, or is it merely an illusion? Who's controlling who? Is new technologies controlling the cultural discourse or completely contradictory? And maybe our guest from United Kingdom, Douglas Murray, will start. Of course, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to join me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with your colleagues again in all sorts of uh, apologies and happiness in New York. Excuse me. Do, do you have any microphone? Because we are having a problem of um, hearing you, sir. I've just had this discussion with your colleagues. I hope it's clear enough. Yeah, it's better. Thank um, you. Let me um, persevere, if possible. Um, if I speak now, can you hear? Yes, it's fine. Thank you. We are let me forge ahead. Um, the, the, I, I, would, I say this first of all, which is that the, the polarization which we often talk about now is to do with new technologies. Is not just the technologies that have emerged, but the breakdown of the old. And this is an important thing to bear in mind because it bears in mind the crucial issue of what we now call the old media. 
Um, focusing on the new media, we have to remember the problems that exist with the old media. And one of them has been created by new technologies, and that is this. Um, uh, without making this sound too grandiose, um, all of our old sense-making technologies have broken down, by which I mean the public have seen through old media and have decided that they do not like this. Evidence of trust in the old media across all of our countries has plummeted in recent years. The media has been exposed in country after country for failings, for biases, many of which existed before, but which were not apparent to the general public before in the way they are now. But here's the thing that new technology has put on top of this. Um, and this is one of the things that's caused what I describe in the madness of crowds as the mass derangement of our era. Uh, until the era of new technologies of Facebook, the internet, and so on, we all knew roughly where the publications and organs and media that we were imbibing, where they came from. So you could absorb a particular type of media, you could read a particular paper, watch a particular television channel, and you might understand that that particular channel or that particular paper was coming from a particular direction. Uh, that is to say, for instance, I'm, I can read the New York Times. I always could. And I knew where it was coming from. Uh, I could read its theater reviews, for instance, and I knew I could roughly trust them. Uh, I might read The Economist magazine. I might learn certain things about countries I might not be reading about regularly otherwise. And I knew when I was reading it that The Economist had a specific slant on specific issues. For instance, it was obviously a free market, free trade publication, to mention the most benign. Uh, but I, I, I knew as a reader and as an absorber of the media where it was coming from. And to a great extent, all of us did. And that has been completely scrambled by the new technology era. What we now live in is an era not just where we distrust those old media platforms, but where we do not have the apparatus, individually or um, as a culture, to know what it is we're reading and what filter to look at it through. To put it another way, I knew the filter I had to put between myself and certain publications in the past. And today, none of us have the capacity to apply that filter across all of the information which we're absorbing. And, the, and one of the consequences of this has been what you refer to rightly in your introduction as the polarization issue. The polarization issue comes uh, about in part because in lieu of having the capability to filter and read everything that comes across our, our phone screens throughout the day, we choose the narrative that we would like to go down. We choose the narrative that we would like to fit. And where I am at the moment in the United States, obviously, we see the, the biggest example of that played out on the biggest stage in the world. Uh, in the US now, you have uh, people who believe that the 2020 election was stolen, and you have another significant portion of the country that believe the 2016 election was stolen. Uh, the media that pursued the 2016 narrative are still pursuing the 2016 narrative. The people pursuing the 2020 narrative are still pursuing the 2020 narrative. So this is just one of the consequences of it. The new technology would mean we do not have the capacity individually to work out what it is that we're absorbing. And so we find ourselves in this peculiar situation of choosing a narrative because it makes things, apart from anything else, slightly easier. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Zyberetovic, um, the main topic that I would like to discuss in this question, uh, let me uh, re refrain to that again, is do we still have control over what we created? Uh, I mean, the new technologies, social media, or do they have control over us? Uh, who's uh, controlling who in the situation when culture is being in the uh, shift point? I think that since the technologies has been networked, that is, that since the emergence of the internet, technology 
which for ages was our tool, our servant, started to become our master because uh, technology that, that's deeply networked and the internet of things and 5G will immensely increase this process. This technology behaves as an uh, merely autonomous agent. Te now technology develops beyond anybody's full control and, and cognition. And to some extent, this, this process was captured by, by the idea of Shosanna Zubov, who published a, a, a famous books, The Age of the Surveillance Capitalism. And in an interview in, given to a Polish journalist two years ago, Shosanna Zubov said, we now witness a, a putsch behind the the, the blind mirror in Poland, we say Venetian mi mirror that's used in interrogative rooms by the police. That there is a number of guys behind the mirror who control the big tech, who, who collect the data on our behavior, who control our algorithms and use them to control us and exploit us on a much deeper level. Let's us try to capture properly what she said. She's a professor of Harvard University. There is a, a push behind the one-way mirror. The guys behind the mirror can watch us, and we are not sure who is there, and, and what sort of, of knowledge asymmetry has emerged. And, uh, in this context, I, I, I would like to pose a, a question to Douglas Murray. I'm not sure if I understand, understood you properly because of the quality of the connection, but happily I, I've, read, I've read your book, uh, Madness of Crowds. The, and my question is, the, the very speed and scope of this process that you so deeply describe in your book. Would it be possible without new digital technologies? Are the, are the puppet masters located behind the mirror, the masters described by Shosanna Zubov, responsible for the speed of the process getting us into this madness? Before I'm going to <laughs> to give the floor again to Mr. May, let me ask the same question, but in Polish to Professor Nalaskowski. Panie Profesorze, dzisiaj media społecznościowe... Dear Professor, today new technologies uh, uh, went out of our control. They became an actor in this cultural uh, spectacle that we were observing. Uh, did we have uh, control over them before? And do we still have control over them uh, with regard to what our four speakers said? They uh, take over to control over us. This problem, I was thinking about in Polish, and my mind was Polish language, so I, I'll be speaking in Polish about this. I can't, I can't translate my Polish, my specific Polish, to my specific English, so I will answer in Polish. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I am under the impression that we are some kind of underground, uh, that we uh, uh, it's a kind of clandestine meeting, maybe due to COVID for one um, period, well, it's one uh, reason, but we are some kind of, we are not mainstream. The mainstream is somewhere out of there, and we are a kind of conspiracy group. It's the city center of Warsaw. Everyone one can join us and a lot of people are watching us online but um, ladies and gentlemen so I wanted to say that I have followed based on two changes that implemented uh, that were implemented by two technologies they uh, when it comes to their nature they are educational purely the first change is 
the popularization of unlimited and untamed exchange of thoughts. What do I mean by that? I do not want that to sound uh, trivial, but uh, until the time when I got uh, the professor degree, I used to type on a typing machine when the computers entered. I was enchanted by the myriad of po possibilities that I can create the ready version um, on this, of, the, without any repetitions and rewriting. So before I need to have this paper on the roll and this process was in reversible. So I took greater responsibility for what I'm supposed to write because it was very difficult to revert it. And people typing on a keyboard stopped being responsible for what they're writing. And we had a whole class of Peter's pen. Uh, adults who behave as children, an imminent feature of childhood that is stressed by everyone. This is the lack of responsibility. We perceive uh, in a different manner a kid kicking an adult uh, be uh, below the table, under the table, and it's totally different if an adult does the same. This is the issue of liability, of responsibility. So this trivialization of life enters, and it's not only expressed by the language, because people people just tell to themselves, so what? So this lack of penalization and carelessness is greater. I will not quote people who are, whom I don't like, but the second thing is the image. I'm 64 years old, and I've been brought with analog uh, cameras. You had 64 uh, slides, and you was you were responsible for each of them because you had to go to the the photographer to have your pictures, and now you can revert everything apart from some valuable things that got registered we register and i also think about such uh, ears dropping for example recording some um, information so a lot of information became this disinformation so this um, technology cost that we had compromising efforts and we had different uh, games and tricks being played in order to undermine somebody's uh, dignity sometimes. And so that the new technology that set us free from uh, some mistakes and but also from responsibility and we have we live in the image-based culture. So give me the print screen, uh, send me the, the image. So that cultural change cost that we turned our back on the DNA of our culture, Latin culture, which was based and focused on reading. You cannot read a movie based on literature because the author wrote the book in order to be read, not shortened, abridged, and screened. So this lack of responsibility means that we lost control over tools that we created, the tools of new technology. We didn't have this control ever. Professor Zbertovich, in his column, wrote that you should catch your kid by their hand when crossing the street, and you should teach them to cross the street on the green light. And here we didn't even try to have this control. It's like taming a large herd of this herd of technology that entered different areas of our life. Let's see what happens with Twitter. I'm one of these people who was never present on Facebook or Twitter. I do not know the principle of it. I don't know it. 
I was not, I, I, I've never tried, but I've seen that thanks to death, I'm free and I can escape many unpleasant situations because we're losing control. But on the other hand, we have never had this control. We didn't try to control. On the other hand, uh, on this uh, one side mirror, there is some kind uh, limited group of people controlling others. And we don't know why, and we don't know who is that. But behind this Venice mirror, when we're talking about this control, maybe it, it, it's there. But we do not control it for sure. We buy more new technologies, devices like smartphones, like other things. I've, wrote, I've written a text about the culture of applications that we have the face we have a reface apps, for example. We want to play, and great revolutions were also always evoked by some atrocities, historical atrocities, or boredom. So if people come up with new technologies and they will come till the end, the world will become very boring. Uh, Mr. Mai got a question from uh, Professor Zebertowicz. Uh, maybe now is the time to answer if you would like to refer to that question. Thank you. Yes, this is a very important point. Uh, and as I mentioned, you may know, in one chapter of the crowd. And that is about how the search engines in particular can be shown to have been uh, adapted and um, uh, slanted to prove particular points. Now, I think everybody present probably knows the way in which search engine optimization works. Um, but one of the most disturbing things in our era, which I've tried to describe, is the way in which um, a, a new ideology or a new metaphysics, uh, as I describe it, has been partly embedded in our societies, or our societies have been pushed towards that new ideology, that new metaphysics, through the medium of uh, social media and the search engines. And, and, and let me give a couple of examples. Um, most users, and this goes back to what I referred to earlier, most users of, for instance, Google image search do not know or do not sufficiently appreciate the extent to what they, that what they are asking for is not what they are given. So the assumption of the uh, user will tend to be, unless the user is, is, is pretty literate in these new technologies, the assumption will, will tend to be that if you ask for a thing from the search engine, you will get the thing you've asked for. And, and that isn't the case. And uh, Google image searches is one of the most interesting ones because, as I've shown, it, it's the most obvious. Um, there are certain problems that the search engines have tried to get around. For instance, the fact that historically certain professions are dominated by men. Uh, secondly, that they have tended to be dominated by white men. Um, there are obvious examples, uh, physicists, um, uh, certain parts of the, scientists, the sciences, and, uh, and certain other professions. What uh, Google Image Search has tried to do is to effectively cover over what it sees as being an uncomfortable fact by two, two methods. The first, as you'll know, is what is called machine learning fairness, where the machine is taught to be fairer than us as human beings on the presumption that we as human beings are innately biased and bigoted and see what we want to see. Machine learning fairness says, um, because we are flawed, we will, have, we will allow the machine to be unbiased for us. Now, here's the kicker on that. If that was just handing over understanding of history, understanding of the present to a machine, that would be one thing. But what we can also see in the search engines, and as I say, particularly in Google image searches, is the extent to which 
it's not just machine learning fairness. It's machine learning fairness plus an ideology. For instance, if you search for Western art as a student or anyone else using Google, using Google image searches, uh, people can do it now. I haven't done it for a few weeks now. But if you search for Western art, you might be hoping to get one thing, such as um, an unbiased uh, example of the plethora of culture that the West has produced. But Google image searches has decided that you would be morally suspect if you were searching for that. And it's decided that in any case, it has to reprogram us and it has to change the history. So that, for instance, in a search for images about Western art, you will get a disproportionate, a uh, wildly disproportionate uh, a number of portraits, for instance, of um, black Europeans from the past uh, or uh, portraits by women and others so that Although this doesn't accurately portray the past, whatever you think of the past, it is how Google image searches would like the past to have been. So, for instance, the European past was always multicultural in the eyes of Google image searches. It was always something which showed a rough parity between the sexes in creative ability and more. Uh, and so this is a sort of long answer to the question, but it's an important question and something we need to discuss and get out there, which is that all of these things which uh, um, an untutored user of new technologies thinks they are requesting information for honestly and getting honest information back on, they are not. Everything, right down to the images, are being filtered through a specific ideological worldview, a specific ideological lens. And I'm certain myself that many of the deranging arguments of our day would not be going on if this wasn't going on behind them. That, as you say, this, the, the, sort of, the, the people behind the mirror, if they were either clearer from the outset or not known about, this would be a lot easier. Um, if we knew exactly what the control mechanism was in the same way as, for instance, we used to know who owned a newspaper and therefore certain things about the newspaper, that would be one thing. It would be another thing if, if this was a total secret, but it isn't. We're in this in-between phase where people have started to work out that they are being manipulated, that we are being manipulated, that our history is being manipulated, and much more. And that it is happening at an incredibly fast speed. A speed faster, I think, than our societal legs can carry us. Uh, thank you. You already answered one of my questions that I had prepared, so Professor Zabertovich just shoot straight to the point. Uh, but let me refer to that people are on the different side of the mirror, as you refer to them, uh, the people that are really the um, you know, conductors of, of the cultural revolution through the new technology. Uh, often in public debate, uh, there is an argument that those people have a ideology bias. They are more into left or liberal point of view. And because of that, the tools that they created, and the, the apps that we are using, are somehow resembling those views, as um, Mr. Murray was saying, or maybe through the search engines. Is it, a, is it a true assumption that those tools that are supposed to be transparent, for example, like Twitter or like Facebook, they're just simply like a knife that we can cut the bread or hurt someone, are not transparent at all, but they're part of the cultural war maybe, or maybe this is just a good excuse for conservatives uh, to show that we are in defense and cannot do anything about it. There are some premises to suspect them. some of them, some of these big figures of Silicon Valley feel like self-established gods because there is such a, uh, as one and noticed Yuval Harari, an Israeli historian. They are in possession of unprecedented historically asymmetry of, of wealth, knowledge, and power. Never ever in human history such a tiny group of people were in possession of a, such a huge volume of information 
sorts of big data, sorted and manipulated via various algorithms, instruments of influence. Uh, recently, big tech even is taking over some basic functions of the state. For example, security functions. When United States recently was attacked by hackers, it was Microsoft systems that first detected the attacks, not, not uh, American government institutions. It's, it's recognized, it's uh, analyzed, it's ha it has far-reaching consequences. Of course, the data gathered by those tech companies also help to predict COVID uh, pandemic, for the, example, the, how it spreads. The, the point is that these guys are, are not ready to accept some lessons that we should draw from history, that any human power has limits. They have such an uh, unprecedented amount of, of control of, an, of, of, of our thinking that start to believe that they can deeply remaster the human universe. They're very, for example, quite recently, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, idea of metaverse is, is, is just a, a display of his ambitions. And, uh, but I would like to, use, again, use the opportunity of talking maybe, to... Maybe, dear professor, at the end of the conversation, because I'm okay. not going to have an opportunity to ask those questions that I have. Fine. You used one, that's, that, that's good enough. Uh, Profesor Naraskowski, panie profesorze, jest pan pedagogiem, zajmuje się pan rozwojem, e, zwłaszcza młodych. You uh, are, uh, Mr. Naraskowski, you are into development of young people. That might be um, quite a difficult question when it comes to uh, culture and society, TikTok, Netflix, Instagram, uh, the whole bunch of applications for fun and entertainment. Uh, they influence and shape the new generation that stopped reading books. The school uh, doesn't perform uh, its educational uh, function is the same. Family loses in importance and church as well. Who has a greater influence now nowadays? Uh, applications and new technologies or maybe the structures as we used to know them before, uh, are they ready to defend themselves in long perspective? The um, research on influence in social sciences is very difficult because it's very difficult to apply any um, methodological uh, research methods. So there will be always the probability which um, that will be detected and not the truth. So, but when it comes to this, they autonomy and the split media or tradition maybe it's a just a false division between media and uh, a tradition no it's not false i think i think that you can um, apply it so we uh, see only what we can name but I think that the surrounding and this uh, educational sphere, quoting Professor Schultz, uh, so this surrounding uh, where, where we uh, grow, this is that emerges on the verge, on the brink. And the common ground here, uh, the, the shared part of the two resources when new technologies is the place where the new technologies overlap with traditional upbringing and this is when the dispute starts and the typical dispute up to now was that school about two years ago there was a project that school followed uh, and uh, protected people from overusing computers and they had some media education which was trivial and they tried to protect children uh, against computers and life and pandemic for schools to push children towards computers and school as a computer screen because there was no other way around. So the school was taken into parentheses. And now the issue of um, uh, overlapping tradition um, and tradition, young people sitting at the same table and everyone clicking their, um, on their screen, on their device. So when we talk 
about the influence of this mixture, this mixture of tradition and new technologies, which was undefined. So this gray zone, can we expect it? that it influences and it pushes some image. Let me point out that I'm under the impression for many years now, for some years now, that students who might be talking uh, to during oral examination, they use the Polish language for the purpose of this uh, examination and they treat this official Polish as a foreign language so it was as they because they speak totally different associations connotations abbreviations on everyday basis so I forced them to play some role and they do not feel comfortable with this role one of my colleagues uh, one professor the outstanding professor a socio sociologist who left university and engaged in social activity and I asked him whether he's planning to go back to university he said no because he don't want to go back to this category of young people of students that shows that uh, this is one possible consequence of overlap uh, between new technologies and tradition and this new technology and normal life. When we can see that this is an explosive mixture or a depressive mixture, when we enter the zone, which is quite obvious for all of us, and let's name it, it's sanctioned with tradition or with some habit, some custom or law, and somebody else enters this zone and feels uncomfortable that this is a threat, I wouldn't name because I'm not an expert in that. I don't know if there is one Venice mirror or one or two of them, or maybe there are some um, uh, some other and who is observing whom. But what I know for sure is that uh, digitalization and this new technology was a, a fluffy puppy and we liked to caress it. And now it's a, an, an aggressive uh, dog and we don't know how to do with it. I see mostly negative consequences. The youth stopped talking, stopped practicing sports because the element of adrenaline and risk is present in uh, gaming. They are not surprised by anything. It became the pornography, which used to be taboo, became widespread to different content that we have no idea about. And if we will heal our wounds after that for a long time, if we don't take the proper educational decisions, we will see dire consequences in six or seven years. It will backfire. So if we don't summing up, for example, remote education now, it's too early to jump to any conclusions. We will see uh, and we will see the consequences when these people go to university. So a black case scenario of the future, a gloomy scenario. Mm, you're referring in your book, uh, The Madness of the Crowds, to the somehow tectonic shift of the um, young generation, uh, how, how they operate in, in the society. Uh, there is a term in, in English about those group of, of people that are easily offended somehow as a snowflake generation, a generation that uh, likes to live in a comfort zone and safe spaces. Of course, I'm, I'm only referring to some phraseology. I'm not trying to to give a, a, an easy answer f about uh, why those people are behaving in a way that you're describing in your book as uh, sometimes maybe uh, mm, wrong according to how societies should, should develop. Do you think that this generation would develop in a similar way without new technologies or new technologies are somehow responsible for, uh, for, for, for this world that we live in about that you can offend pretty much everyone saying every, uh, everything uh, in social media. Who's responsible about this generation that we refer to sometimes uh, as a snowflakes generation? 
Well, let me just say first, uh, um, just pick up on something that the professor just said. Uh, this issue of attention span, for instance, we've known about for quite a long time now with the internet, and it's a very disturbing issue. Uh, all of the data on it that shows that the number of seconds that uh, um, adults as well who, who, who have imbibed the internet too much, the number of seconds that we can actually concentrate on something before our attention being taken away onto something else, or indeed feeling a sort of the niggling urge uh, to do something else, it has just shortened to, to a really catastrophic extent. There was a book about 15 years ago by a professor strangely enough, of, of, of um, literature at, I think, University of Berkeley or you know, one of the universities in, in California, UCLA perhaps, who wrote a book called The Lost Art of Reading, where he admitted that he himself, a professor of literature, had lost the ability to read a novel. And he realized this when his, his son said he didn't like F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, Great Gatsby, or at least wasn't getting on with it. The father says, I, I love that book, I'll read it with you, we'll read a chapter a day. And the father realizes he can no longer read without, after a few paragraphs, feeling this sense that I've got to check my emails, I've got to see my phone, whatever text has come through. He becomes aware that he also has lost the art of reading. So this isn't just something that the um, students are vulnerable. We're all vulnerable to it. And we all have to make sure that we train or retrain ourselves away from being this disastrous present tenseist uh, uh, people. As for the thing, very quickly on, on uh, what you refer to as what's sometimes known as snowflakes, I have um, a, a, a sometimes unusual position on this, on the conservative right, in that most people are highly um, um, uh, um, uh, rude and dismissive of young people who fit into this sort of snowflake category, and I'm not. I'm very sympathetic to them, and I think they deserve sympathy. Because when all of us were growing up, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm only in my 40s, but when I was growing up, you know, you were still able to make mistakes, for, for instance. I think we probably, everyone uh, over the age of 40 here probably was. Uh, you were still able to try things out, try ideas out, say things that maybe later you wouldn't, wouldn't believe, but you try things out, for instance. Uh, uh, that has become almost impossible for the generation that's growing up in the internet era. Because if you... Um, where the wrong one mistake was. stays with you forever when you made it on Instagram for example yes uh, I give quite a few examples I mean there's a there's a there's one I think is just particularly pitiful of an American a nice American girl going to her um, her prom that is the sort of end of school uh, uh, event she posts a photograph of herself in a sort of Chinese themed oriental pretty red dress and posts it on Instagram to, to get likes and by the time she's come back from her school prom, she's gone around the world as an example of a racist because people said that she, a white girl, shouldn't be wearing a Chinese-inspired patterned dress. Now, of course, this in itself is madness, the idea that we can't appropriate or um, appreciate uh, and take part in things from other cultures. But the point is, is that this entirely innocent act, which in any previous era would have at the very worst, uh, um, got you one friend saying they didn't like your dress, has become the risk of instant global uh, shame. And so I understand and I'm very sympathetic to young people who feel completely boxed in in their lives. Our experience as human beings is, is that we, we start out from a place and we go out and we go out as broadly as we can into the world and, and learn and experience. And the generation that's brought up with this threat over them is being kept at best in this lockstep situation. Don't tread out of your boundaries. Don't, to use a horrible American phrase of our era, don't get out of your lane. And so a young person growing up in that deserves not just dis the, the disdain and the joking, which it's very easy to do, but a profound sympathy. And it is, the, it is a job of the adults in our society to work out reasonable ways to help young people through this, this phase, this era, and to be able to come of, out of it the other side with at least a modicum of an opportunity to be a reasonable, um, humane, thoughtful, witty, 
at all. Thank you for that interesting answer. Uh, Professor Zabertovich, you once referred in, in an interview to the term uh, that you're calling techno-enthusiasm, technophilia, uh, which you uh, describing as uh, an idolatrous and reflective attitude to technology, currently mainly digital, uh, and you're saying that this is probably the most dangerous of modern ideologies. Uh, could you explain to us why are you so afraid of techno-enthusiasm? Many people in, in Poland who sympathize with right-wing attitudes, who, who feel conservatists, often perceive the gender ideology as the, the, the strongest threat to, to the basic human values, to stability of social systems. But I think that we would not witness such a spread, force, and dynamic of this gender ideology without unfettered development of digital technologies. I think that unreflexive attitude, positive attitude towards technology, towards artificial intelligence, toward crypto money, quantum computing, social media, whatever, metaversum, whatever you can imagine, this supports trends of losing control over human life. That I cannot identify any more ideology that would have more potential of destruction, of more potential of escaping our understanding and control. And I think that uh, anybody who is uh, uh, who read or who is willing to read uh, uh, the, the Madness of Crowds, the book of uh, by Douglas Mary, should supplement this book with another book well known to, to, to Mr. Mary, the book published by Vivek Ramaswamy, Work in Cooperation Inside the Social Justice Scam. In this book, Vivek Ramaswamy, an American of Hin Indian origin, provides evidence how big tech and some other huge corporation, for example, also European like Volkswagen, are a cynically using ideology of, of protection of climate, of protection of, of, of uh, women rights, of uh, black people rights, uh, all this stuff as a, as a shield to avoid control over the way they carry out business. And when I was reading The Madness of Crowds, what I missed there was to find the, the fuel for this process, how the spread of this madness is that quick, how it seems overwhelming in many social... And, and what's the fuel? And, and Vivek Ramaswamy provides the answer, because the big business uses as a, as a smoke screen for their cynical ways of making money and, 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 and getting control over human behavior. Professor, you said early in uh, your speech that you felt as if you were in the underground when discussing these issues. I'd like to ask you from a different point of view. Let's not create this uh, impression that conservatives only meet at these conferences uh, complaining about uh, technology and their impact on the society. This might be just a justification to not really act proactively. Why do you think that conservatives, or however we, uh, whatever we call them, feel in the defensive? Why do not they? Why don't they use these tools to spread their own worldview? Why are they not as effective in this as uh, the left, the liberals? I'd like to say I do not know, but I, s I think 
that if we have both sides to the argument, there's black and there's white and there's some margin of gray in between. I think it's impossible not to fight the other party without using their language, without using their methods, their images, their lack of their lack of scruples. And we are incapable of that because the fact is that in our case, this is related to cert a certain religiosity, what you call right wing, is using your reason uh, and mind while the other party uses emotion and they focus on shouting ever louder and we don't do that. We can't do that simply. Of course, this is a simplification for the needs of this discussion. So the so-called right wing is, uh, you know, doomed to um, fail, to lose in this battle? Well, that's not so obvious. We don't yet have the tools. We might not have the cannons available at this point, but it does not mean we won't have them at our disposal in the future. I think that at this point we are all surprised because this is the issue of just last few years, like Mr. Zivertovich said, of um, stunning development, an explosion of uh, what we do not accept. If we're talking punishing for taking a stance on gender issues, for example, I don't want to um, repeat what's already been said in this discussion. These, you know, um, protesting to what's become obvious these days was unexpected. We have been attacked with the most unexpected weapon because we were not expecting uh, for limits of reasoning to be uh, crossed. So we've been uh, clubbed by barbarians, um, uh, referring to Mr. Professor, uh, to Professor Roszkowski. Of our conversation, I've started with the one question to each, every one of you uh, interlocutors, and I would like to answer. Uh, I would like to end with also one question to, to, to each every one of us, and then maybe if time will be still in our favor, we'll ask a question from the audience. So, without ending in this grim manner of. Uh, the world of conservative value is collapsing through the new technologies. Could we find a, a positive outcome from the new technologies? How to use them for good or to be sufficient in spreading uh, world views in what you believe? What are the positive outcome from this cultural and new technology revolution era that we live in? And Mr. Murray, first, as usual. Oh, uh, well, well, the positives are all around us. I mean, the, one, one of the oddities of our species, by the way, and, and there's, much, there's much evidence of this across issues, is that we, we, we bank gains exceptionally easily and move on. Uh, uh, we all know this from our experience as our societies develop economically, for instance, that, that the instinct isn't to, for instance, um, cherish the advance you've made and the and improved living standards say it's to say why are we not further along the road uh, this is just a, a part of the, the the human instinct we 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 take for granted the things that have happened to us that are good and we moan about the things that haven't happened to us um so let me just uh, in the spirit of trying to prevail against that tendency I give a couple of examples of what we have now. When, again, even when I was growing up, uh, uh, most, most people were present. If you wanted to read a great book, you had to find a library that had the book and hope that nobody else in the area happened to want that book at the same time as you. Uh, this could be quite a long-winded process. Today, almost all of the classics of literature uh, so, uh, 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 that are out of copyright uh, are essentially free or of negligible cost 
to any person. In my pocket, it's true, I have this device that can cause crazy derangement in people. I have this mobile phone that, that can destroy my attention span. I also have, at the tap of a few buttons, all of the great composers in my pocket. I don't have to save up for them. Uh, again, there's a problem with that about what you, um, what you cherish and what you take for granted. But I don't have to uh, be able to afford them. I don't have to be able to save up my money in order to buy an LP or a record or to hope that somebody else I know has access to this music. It's all there for me. And it's all there for all of us. This extraordinary richness of our, our historical culture, of, our, of, of images of our architecture, of our literature, of our philosophy, of our music, all of this is available to us today in a way which our predecessors could only have dreamed of. We don't have to queue to hear something great for the first time. We don't have to wonder what this building might look like. We can see it. So what we have to be able to train ourselves or retrain ourselves to do in a way is to, is to try to avoid the era of distraction and to use the technological progress we have for meaningful ends. Uh, T.S. Eliot describes in one of his great poems the era, and even then he's talking in the 1930s, an era in which we're distracted by distraction from distraction. And this is the era we live in. Eliot, by the way, also refers to, at one point, this twittering world. Um, how far ahead of his time he was. But in this twittering world, in which we are distracted from distraction by distraction, we also have this opportunity to go to the depths, to go to the deeps, and not just in our age to live in the shallows. And that is one of the things that we need to communicate to young people in particular and help to train them to live in. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, so I would like to ask the dear professors for a uh, very summarized uh, short answer for the same question. What is good uh, from the new technology? How can we benefit from them? My answer is simple. If there is this one-way mirror, and behind the mirror there are some guys who are manipulating us, first of all we need to break the mirror put them under, under democratic control, because they rule us without any democratic control ever. Second, when this is done, I mean, when the Washington feels that it can be stronger than Silicon Valley, the humankind needs sort of technological moratorium. We need to slow down the technological, especially digital, progress in order to sort things out. The, after the Second World War, he, humankind managed to make a sort of control over development of nuclear weapons. We need a sort of global Washington-Beijing communication over how to slow down the technological progress in order to avoid the, the digital arms race. Thank you, Panie Profesorze. Czy cokolwiek z nowych technologii? Dear Professor, anything among new technologies which forms today's landscape, do you see anything of that as a positive outcome? I cannot tell. Because we are only inspecting this area. But looking at Douglas Murray's remarks, I conclude that we not only do not have enough knowledge, we don't even have a methodology to look into things. The proposition to have a moratorium on further development seems enticing, but rather unrealistic. If we're talking about the upsides of technology uh, outside things like buying tickets online, 
Um, although I can see a lot of negatives there because somebody might learn that I just came to Warsaw from Torun besides me. I would say that this area is not very well understood yet. And uh, we don't really have a methodology to research it. So we have created a monster that we have out of our control. I see <laughs> those those answers. We will see uh, what uh, the future will write for us. In that matter, we are all part of that revolution. This crowd, this scene, this ability to speak with someone from abroad uh, digitally is also something good that emerged from the cultural and um, technology revolution. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have a time to the question from the audience, but Professor stays here and uh, Mr. Mare is available through the social media, I guess, uh, I assume. Thank you very much again, Douglas Murray in the United States, but from the United Kingdom, Professor Andrzej Zybertowicz and Professor uh, Alexander Nalaskowski. My name is Marcin Makowski. Thank you very much. <laughs>